you're ready to start recording, uh, if you do not want to be recorded, I recommend you turn off your camera and you can rename yourself uh, just so they don't see your name, just for privacy reasons, if that's what you'd like to do. Most of the recording, though, is going to consist of me talking with my slide deck, uh, and then we'll get to the discussion at the end of that. All right, so let's get started. I do want a quick intro though. Kaz here is my co-host tonight. Kaz will be monitoring the chat. Uh, I will mention later to put your information in there, your questions and things. And uh, then at the end of the presentation, we'll let you unmute and that kind of thing so we can hear all your wonderful voices. So thanks again for joining us. So excited to uh, do this. I. Uh... <laughs> I have a fun time researching this and putting these presentations together for all of you. So um, I love just having the opportunity to uh, find and discover some really cool things that are going on and uh, taking that time to share it with all of you. So uh, welcome to Real Talk, Say This, Not That. Uh, so in progressive messaging, it's really important that we're sure we have the right message and that we're not quite saying the wrong message in a way. Uh, and you'll see why we kind of fall into those traps occasionally. Uh, my name is Jenny Okamoto. I am a grassroots organizer. I'm as, um, also a co-founder with uh, Kaz here for Building Bridges for America. We're about a year old. We're very proud of that. Um, we kind of picked up and after the uh, primary was kind of salt resolved, we knew that Joe was gonna be the presumptive nominee. Uh, we decided to continue this wonderful effort of grassroots organizing that we all got so much out of. Um, my background is I was the state organizer, volunteer organizer for the Pete Buttigieg campaign. I formed Indiana for Pete. Uh, so we were doing trainings and canvassing and traveling all over the state. Uh, we got to go into other states, which was a lot of fun, uh, and do door knocking and work with field offices. Uh, so the Pete campaign was very open to these volunteer army of grassroots organizers. So we, we had a great time with that. Once Pete dropped and Joe kind of picked up that nomination, I formed Indiana for Joe Biden, which eventually became Indiana for Biden-Harris. Uh, once again, volunteer, uh, worked with the campaign as a regional volunteer lead. Uh, there's their communities united, did phone banking, texting, training. We did our weekly Indiana for Joe. So basically whatever grassroots organizers do, that's what we did. Uh, and then I volunteered for the John Ossoff campaign as a training lead, uh, training on phone banks out of uh, uh, Ohio, which was fun, or actually out of their Southern States office uh, with the John Ossoff campaign. So I'm very pleased to see all the candidates that I've supported have done so well. Uh, and it's been very, very rewarding. Um, and after all of this, uh, we decided to form Building Bridges last year. Uh, and we, um, I work on the uh, steering committee, co-founder, and on the development, um, I worked on a program called Building Bridges to the White House, kind of helping people keep them informed during the presidential election. A few friendly norms. Um, please keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. Uh, interest yourself in the chat. Feel free to go and let us know where you're from. Uh, anything you feel like you want us to know about you, like passions are, uh, if you've worked with a campaign before, uh, say hello to everybody else so they can say, hey, you worked on this campaign too, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then enter your questions. I always call them parking your questions. Park them in the chat because they're going to pop up as you go through and you can't really interrupt. Uh, and Kaz will capture those and we will, you know, circle back to those. That's the new Biden administration. <laughs> Well-used term I like, circle back. We'll circle back to those. And of course, Q&A at the end. And like I said, we'll talk about some messaging. We keep our meetings to an hour. We like to respect your time. Typically what happens, we'll hit that hour and we'll say, hey, if you need to sign off, you're welcome to sign off. Uh, and then once again, thanks for taking the time to learn about messaging and for joining us. It's really great to have you here. Uh, a couple housekeeping things. Um, if you do want to uh, say yay, that's a great idea. I love that. Use your reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also raise your hand and that's really great because it'll put you in order of when you raised your hand. So we can uh, be diplomatic here and make sure we, we call on you. If you're using your phone, that's going to be at the little, the three little dots at the bottom right of your phone. You're going to click on that first, then you'll get your reaction option. So those are your two choices there. Okay. You go to presentation mode, it's so much nicer. 
Okay, so our agenda tonight, we're gonna do a quick introduction about building bridges. We're gonna talk about what is messaging. We have a lot of new people on this call. We have some people returning, uh, just to give you an idea of like what we mean by messaging and, and kind of how this all works together when we're talking to people and kind of connecting with their, their framing that we're gonna talk a lot about. We'll explain what that is. Um, and then we're talking about some effective messaging. I like to call it winning messaging. Uh, so we'll talk about some that work and, and kind of how to craft those effective messages. Uh, uh, and we'll have some examples throughout the presentation. Great. Uh, so a little bit about Building Bridges for America. Uh, we're a group of grassroots organizers. We're a national organization. We're all volunteer. Uh, and basically, all of us kind of came from the Pete Buttigieg primary campaign. We some of us were new to politics, some of us had uh, experience, but we really loved how that campaign was run. Uh, we loved the idea of the whole uh, respect for people, that you were inviting people in. We knew, I think, that we had the winning message. Uh, you know, a lot of people that um, are kind of moderates or in the middle, or uh, we'll talk more about those, uh, they, you know, if you make them feel they can't be included, that they've done something wrong by voting for somebody before, but it was really, really smart, the approach that we made. And um, it's really important that we continue that. We really love that type of politicking. It was something completely new. Uh, so we wanted to continue that kind of uh, understanding of servant leadership, of supporting progressive candidates, and also those wonderful grassroots organizers out there, people that are looking to become one or had done the work before. We didn't want to lose them because it's such an amazing force uh, when it comes to campaigning. It really does make the difference. Uh, and our values are really, really important to, um, to us. Uh, it's important that everybody feel that no matter what they have to contribute, it is valuable. Uh, whatever led let level of engagement you want to do, whether it's just attending a meeting like this or doing some social media posts or organizing your own events, everything is really, really valuable and very, very important. Um, and it's very important that we're, we have a broad coalition, that's the great Democratic Party that we are, um, and that we're inclusive, that we invite people to join us. So, uh, and we also still follow Pete Buttigieg's Rules of the Road, uh, those 10 tenets that we love. My, my favorite one is boldness. Um, being a grassroots organizer isn't always easy, to believe in what you're doing and and uh, being bold and saying I can really affect change is 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 really really important. Um, so it's very important uh, to us that people that we protect our demo democracy, that uh, people are informed so they can make decisions, um, and that everybody feels valued and belongs. So I uh, that's our missions, values, uh, vision. Uh, also, too, we have our lenses. It's basically how we approach um, any of our uh, presentations. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a level of the, the belonging is addressed that. We have that rural urban uh, issue that we're talking democratic reform. There's been some great stuff in the news even the past 24 hours about the Supreme Court and the Electoral College. Uh, and that racial equity is really, really important to us too. So we like to make sure that we're addressing those issues um, in every kind of, it's kind of our lenses for which we see all of our programming through. Uh, what we do as a function so we have these great talks, Kaz hosts some, I host some on Thursdays, uh, but we also do these action events where we're putting people to work. We give people a focus to go to. Uh, so we have uh, movie nights, these call to actions, you're writing postcards, uh, you might do some texting. Uh, we inform people uh, with our trivia and, and that kind of thing. We have a spectacular book club. I can't say enough about this. We just finished Stacey Abrams' book, which was wonderful. Uh, and our next book coming up is Kill Switch about uh, the filibuster, which is so relevant right now. So um, yeah, really exciting things we're doing. All of our events and programs are listed on our gorgeous website. Uh, and also you can just, you can link straight through to go register for those. So including the real talks, uh, like I said, also all of our presentations are, are archived there and there's some great resources uh, to kind of broaden your, your education. Um, so just to remember, we start April 26th with our next book club. Uh, you can attend with or without reading the book. Uh, the discussions tend to be pretty uh, general based questions on the subject matter. Uh, so we find people that don't even, you know, busy schedules get a chance to read it. You'll get a lot out of it. Uh, Kaz has her presentation coming up next week. Uh, we're gonna be talking about disinformation, which is so important in the social media um, environment that we're in. So that's a great discussion to talk about. Once again, just go to our Building Bridges for America website and you can sign up there. 
also, we have some new roles opening up. We want people to get involved. Uh, so do you have a skill to share, whether it's data or uh, technical or social media or leadership development? We want you to be part of our team. Uh, specifically, we're looking for members of our social media team. Uh, it's great because it is a group of people managing the social media. It's not just one person, which it can be a lot of work. So if you're interested in, in, in putting your talents to work for the overarching organization, uh, just drop that in the chat and we'll get someone from each of those team leads to kind of follow up with you and talk with you a little further about what that would entail uh and uh yeah and also too we have our hubs program so if you wanted to form your own grassroots organization uh, we can mentor you and walk you through that process too so let's talk a little bit about this word messaging so messaging is basically how we sell an issue it's like your messaging, it's, it's, it's a marketing, it's like an advertisement for that program. So you're trying to find that right sweet spot with that message uh, and making sure that when you put it out on all your platforms that it's really going to resonate with people. So there's a lot of research and, and checking back and forth and making sure that you've got that right message before you put all of that money, time and energy, time, talent and treasure um, into that particular message. And we've heard this a lot. What kind of sparked me on this whole line of uh, working on progressive messaging is you hear Democrats are kind of bad at messaging. Uh, we have a lot of people that say that we just sound like we're talking over them, uh, that we're superior. Um, and when we learn more about the types of people, they're not as savvy. You know, they, they don't spend their time like we do learning about these things. Um, they're busy. And so it's important that when we speak our message that we're really simple and clear and we take in consideration what people are thinking because, um, and I'll, I'll bring up her name quite a bit, but Anat Shanker Osario is kind of my new favorite person. Um, we have really excellent policies and ideas. What Democrats want to do are, it's great. We can, I think we can all agree that they make sense. Um, the whole thing is making sure we're spending time talking about how they're going to affect people's lives and not defending the idea of this abstract idea that's being thrown at them. Uh, so we really want to focus, and you'll see with the current administration, they're really pushing out what it's going to do for you. Not that, hey, this is the policy we have and all these wonderful ideas and boy, don't worry about it. It makes sense. Here's the facts. Really talking to people in the sense of like how this affects their every day, um, because we really, really do have great, great programs that we're going to do to make uh, people's lives better. You know, Democrats, we talk policy a lot and facts, and we'll just throw a bunch of statistics at someone, or we'll just assume that they understand the concept. Um, Republicans, they keep it really simple and they really focus on emotion. If you hear them a lot, they'll be, it's, it's more of like, yelling, screaming, outrage. And you'll probably hear the same, like three or four things coming out of their mouth consistently from everyone. Whereas we'll be more specific and more intellectual about it. And why, you know, why wouldn't you want to do something that's good and fair and equitable? So, you know, talking policy to people is not messaging. We have to talk about what that policy is going to do for that family, for that voter kind of thing. Um, you know, when we talk facts to people, it just bounces off these frames, which are kind of like these uh, ideas, these moral kind of standards that people have. Uh, it's just going to bounce right off like a beach ball and head on down the road. Uh, or it's going to cause more harm than good and people are going to feel like we're talking down to them. Uh, so we need to be careful with that. So what are frames? They're structures of ideas that we use to understand the world. They're they're built from experience, whether it's it's how our families raised us or, or our personal kind of archive of experience. So a lot of times, you know, it's how we see things. Like, do we see the world as fair? Do we see that, um, you know, there's opportunity for everyone? Uh, you know, we have our progressive frames where we're like, hey, new things are great. The future is great. You know, these things are wonderful. We embrace those, those things. Whereas, you know, with conservative values, the past is a little better. It's a little safer. They're not as comfortable kind of taking these risks. Whereas I'm excited to try something new. I think that's great to be multicultural. Uh, so you can see I'm very, very progressive kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of how they see the world. And a lot of times when we're talking to people, we're messaging to them, we are activating these frames for people. So we might say the same thing to someone like, a guitar is a guitar, but based on your experience with it, it's going to activate something different for you. 
uh, you know, whether you're a guitar aficionado and you're like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And that's a great classic guitar. Or I might just look at it and go, guitars are nice. They make great music. So we are using kind of these words and these phrases to activate these emotions, which are, are basically what we call our shared values or kind of our moral base kind of thing. Um, and it's really, really important. And this happens quite a bit when progressives have to defend something. We end up repeating words and phrases that activate conservative. And it, what that ends up doing is embedding and digging those deeper. So we're actually reinforcing the negative. We're reinforcing what we don't want to reinforce by arguing against it. Uh, you know, so it's, we'll look at some examples of that and how you can kind of turn that around and structure it a little differently than kind of being on the defensive all the time. Um, it's interesting how Republicans might talk, they call it more uh, harms and horrors. Like, oh my God, if immigration, immigrants come through, they're going to bring COVID and they're going to take all our jobs. They have this like disaster kind of catastrophe approach. Whereas we're like, this is great. They deserve res you know, respect and they're going to be an asset to. So there's these different ways and it all has to do with knowing that they're going to trigger these responses in people. Um, a lot of this material about framing is rooted in uh, George Lakoff's research and he has several books on the topic. Uh, they kind of go over uh, from different angles, kind of the same concepts. Uh, Don't Think of an Elephant is kind of his most popular book. Uh, I do recommend the blue book. And what I do is you can get these used off of thrift books or whatever for about $4 a piece. They're used so much in colleges, but they're really a light bulb when you start to read about this and realize that's where these, these frames, these triggers are happening with people. Um, so, you know, we have our frames, they're brought to us by our family. Uh, you know, we do have these values and morals that we develop over time from our personal experience. And that's how, you know, our, these, these frames kind of get embedded. Um, you know, when Pete would talk about politics as moral, he's really saying that you want it, you need to connect with people's morality, their values, trigger those frames, because it's important that people know that, you know, we need to be moral, we need to be respectful, we need to uh, take care of people. So there's always that attitude is politics is a lot more than just policy and fact. Like if you do this and get $15 an hour, these things will happen and make your life better. And we're like, why doesn't that make sense to say a conservative or moderate voter because it's not about just that it's about well people shouldn't be given things they don't deserve so there's it triggers these kind of uh these uh frames for them so looking at both sides a little bit we can kind of break them into these categories a lot of progressives nurturant you know we have equal authority parents they believe that kids should you know we're guiding kids on a path we're raising them they're independent but we're just assisting them um you know we should all care about each other that it's good to care about people and have connection to be empathetic for people you know you look at joe and he's an empathetic leader uh you know that we're responsible to the people around us that we owe something in a sense to give back that um, cooperation is necessary for society to function. Whereas when we look at the conservative side, it's more like patriarchal, you know, a strict father, what father says goes. And it's not a malevolent thing, it's not cruel. They're just saying that you, you it's more of a top-down structure. Uh, you know, they respect authority, respect the police, uh, law and order, uh, you know, we need our freedom from the government. They're going to take away our rights and our liberty. Um, if you're a success, it's because you're, you as an individual created that success for you. If you're a failure, then you've done it on your own. Uh, so they just say, you know, government should stay out of the way and we should have the freedom to pursue our success. Uh, so it's more of kind of like a tough love kind of framework that we're looking at. So we've got our nutrient, you know, nurturant progressives here and our strict father. Something to consider, and we're going to get into this, is that people carry both of these. So some people might have a progressive attitude when it comes to caring for elderly people. Like, of course, we should get them Social Security, right? Uh, that's kind of a progressive thing. Uh, but when they talk about immigration, they may be more conservative, like we shouldn't let anybody in the country. Uh, so we do talk about that. It's called biconceptualism, and we'll get into that a little bit. But this kind of, this typifies basically when you're talking about like a conservative versus a progressive, how they might view the general question about the primary reason somebody is wealthy, 
Like how does somebody, you know, why are they wealthy? Well, for conservatives, they're going to look at it. They achieved their success because they worked harder than others. They earned it. It's their right. They worked for it. Whereas we would look at wealthy Americans because they were given more opportunity. Uh, the barriers to opportunity were taken away, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, just in one of the age old question about success, uh, you know, there is that kind of, you know, one side or the other. So why does conservative messaging seem to work? I'll tell you, it's typically the loudest voice in the room. And, but the same messaging that we use for conservatives is not gonna work for progressives. Uh, th like I said, there is that more harm and hor hor horrors thing going on. The world's gonna fall apart. We're gonna become a socialist Marxist country. All those key words that we've heard, whereas you know, we're t more like, well, we should all just have cooperation. We're more of a coalition. So why does it seem that the conservative message, even though their ideas aren't necessarily very good for people, why are they so successful? And a lot of it has to do with cooperation within the conservative party. Um, you know, a while back, conservatives were like Democrats. They were a coalition of people. Uh, you had like the Tea Party, you go even farther back. There were different like levels of conservatism or republicanism kind of thing. Um, and then about four decades ago, they said, we need to be united. We need to kind of funnel this into one consistent message. And they got really good at forming these consistent sound bites and you'll hear it because you'll hear one guy say it and another guy says it and another guy says it they're all saying the same thing they're all on the same you know the same base together uh so they they perpetuate their the same world view it's very consistent whereas progressives tend to respect people's opinions and worldviews that may differ from theirs it's kind of what makes us who we are um so they're very consistent they're very united to the point where they organize themselves, they get together weekly, they'll do these calls, they'll invite everybody to them from Jenny Okamoto in Indiana, I can actually call in because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a patriot and I'm going to call in to like the top of the Heritage Foundation and they're all going to get on this call and they're all going to talk about, we got to go after, you know, the uh, freedom, the, the, the H1N1, the, the People's Vote Act kind of thing. And they'll figure out a consistent message to that speaks to those frames and reinforces them. They recruit people, they spend money, they have scholarships, think tanks, all kinds of things. They recruit people from a very, very young age. They go out and they recruit people in the field that, to run for offices, office, Bobert's one of those infamously. Kaz was telling me that she was recruited by her local conservative Republican party and they groomed her into the position. Um, and they have resources. I mean, we're talking the wealthy, typically big corporations, it makes sense for them to support that money to keep uh, you know, things the way they want them to go. So um, there's, that's kind of why we see that, you know, why is conservative messaging so successful? So let's, I went through like this week and I was just like, I'm gonna look at some of the key words that are kind of consistently Republican keywords and what Democrats will say. So I kind of went through, I went to the Heritage Foundation site and they were talking about the uh, the the um, the you know their the uh, the voting act basically, um, and a lot of the words they use were like rigging the election and corrupt politicians. They actually renamed it the Corrupt Politicians Act, and they and they had all their messaging laid out. They had tweets ready to go. You could just send them. Uh, it's amazing how organized they are. Um, and they just talk about, you know, overall distrust of the government, how, you know, vote, the Voting Rights Act is going to take away the control of the independent states, whereas we know kind of the opposite is occurring. They know how to kind of sell that messaging. Uh, so they use the terms like, you know, we do ne never want to hear the term radical leftist again in my life. Um, they use that all through the runoff, radical uh, leftist, irresponsible. So if you look at, you know, what their conservative values are, these are kind of antithesis to this. They're, they're saying, oh, they're irresponsible. Uh, they're, they're radicals. They're going to rig the election. They're not trustworthy, right? So these are all great words they can use to reinforce and kind of tie into those frames. Whereas Democrats, we consistently, and I, I was kind of looking at Joe's jobs plan, you know, a lot of talking about coming together, the potential, the future, an investment, uh, equity, justice is important. You know, it really comes down to Democrats want a government for all. Republicans just want to 
have no government, like a distrust of government. So uh, I always, when you open your eyes to it, you'll start to see that there's just these repetitive words and terms that they're kind of consistently using over and over again. So how can we kind of pull together effective messaging? How can we start crafting our messages? Because we, like I said, we have, we have great material. We have a great product. We just got to get it out there. Like we just, we know what we're doing. I'm really impressed with the work that's being done. Um, so here's an example, let's say of some pitfalls of messaging uh, where things just kind of get ahead of us. Uh, you know, defund the police, it's back again. We've, you know, sadly, all the horrible things that are happening. Um, you know, they're going to counter that with these strong values and in, in framing of duty, honor, and courage. And of course, we want to protect the police. The police are there to protect us. And it's very difficult to kind of reconcile the fact that we don't want to defund the police. It's really want to reform. I, I see it more as we want to protect the police from harm. Uh, you know, we should really be speaking that way. Um, you know, and then we we're talking about like raising your voice and fighting. We don't want messaging, like I said, that talks about harm and horror. We don't want to start a war with with Democrats and moderates. We really want to show them that it's appealing, that we're attractive, that we are not another problem and it's not another issue that's going to be created, that we have solutions and this is how you're going to affect your life. So we talk about the art of messaging, framing, creating your messaging. And what's really important is that we find that we have a shared value with people. This is really, it's true. We do really want people to be treated fairly. Uh, conservatives, moderates, you know, persuadables, all that. We're kind of on the same page when it comes to that. So we just need to speak about that. And what you're really doing is reminding people that we all think the same. Like you're really connecting with them on a same shared value of like decency. Yeah, I want freedom too. I don't want the government to tell me what to do with my body just as much as you don't want them to, to take away your guns or make you wear a mask. There's these consistent shared values that are there and we need to remind people that our candidate has them the issue is going to solve that problem, that we as a person who's telling you our story, that we have this shared value. So you have that shared value you connect on. And then you have, you know, the problem, what's the issue? Um, and then you talk about what the solution is. And typically it's more like, you know, shared value. People should be able to provide food for their families, right? That's a pretty, that's, you know, feeding your family is pretty much a shared value that we all want to do. But because of wealthy people, yada, 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 they want us to be divided. We can't provide services and support to people. That's the problem, the people that are getting in the way. And the solution is if we all work together and vote together or work together on this issue, we will be able to solve the problem of immigration or hunger or COVID or things like that. So, you know, shared value. I want all my family members, and I'm sure you do, want your family members to be safe and healthy. The problem that we're getting is people are coming in and, and kind of fighting against these rules about wearing a mask when we know that it's healthy, healthy to do that. If we all get together and work on this problem, we can, we can find the solution. Um, there's one about, you know, we talk about the legal right to an abortion, but the problem is, is, you know, people don't have access to it and it's also hindering affordable health care. If we all work together, people will have more freedom to make choices about their bodies and to stay healthy and avoid unwanted pregnancies, you know, things like that. Um, so I did this really fun illustration. It's, we have something that's called the, the truth sandwich. Well, I made the, you know, <laughs> the message sandwich. So basically what you're doing is you're, you know, the bread on the outside is that shared value. And then you're filling it up with like, okay, this is the problem. And then putting that solution, you put it all together. And basically, uh, you are together on that. What's important, and I like to illustrate here, is that the order in which you present your message is important. You don't want to start off with, it's all going to hell, and this is not going to work because of this person. You want to talk, you want to lock in that, like, you want to bring that consensus in first. So the order in which you state it's really important. You don't want to kind of alienate people before you get a chance to talk about the solution. Um, and I'm going to go through more examples to clarify this because it's a little tricky to digest. It is, it's, aha, 
that was not an intended pun about digesting the sandwich, but um, it is a little tricky to digest. So we will continue to go over that. So like, like I said, we've got our progressives, our conservatives, and then we have these shared values. And they really do make sense that we want people to have opportunity. We want America to be successful. Um, we're seeing a lot of this messaging in the American Jobs Plan. Really, really great. I love it because it's really tying those together. Also, too, you know, we're talking about we have our progressives and our conservatives, and then we have these shared values. What I mentioned earlier is, is people share both of these. You know, I, as a progressive, I might be conservative on taxation. You know, I live in Indiana, and it's really nice that our property taxes are really, really low. Um, so I might be conservative about taxation, but I might be very progressive about, uh, you know, um, care for, uh, for, uh, for pregnant women, that kind of thing. So this is called biconceptualism, where you can kind of carry and shift between these two things. You know, you can have conservative views in one aspect and progressive in others. Um, and you just kind of mix them together. Um, and that's where what's really helpful is if you have someone that leans a lot more on the uh, scale of like kind of conservative, but you can attach to an issue they're progressive about, like I mentioned, social security, which is a progressive, so, socialist progressive idea, but they would not want their parents' social security taken away. They would not want their Medicare or Medicaid taken away. So they, that's a progressive thing that we can attach to, um, you know, like, uh, hey, you know, it's great that your parents get the care that they need and deserve. And, and it's, we want everyone to have that option, especially children kind of thing. Uh, so we can connect with what their progressive is, their progressive attitude is. Um, so we call these people, you know, our swing voters, our persuadables. Um, so there's a really great case study and it's in the links. Um, I'm not gonna read this cause it's huge, but I really feel it's important to give credit where credit's due. This is another one of Anat's wonderful, she's working with the race class narrative um, and they did this really awesome study. What's really cool about it is in your state, you can look up the study for your state. Like I read about Indiana, specifically Indiana voters and messaging to them. So if, say you're, in California, Connecticut, uh, Colorado, you could actually read what their results were about different types of messaging that they sampled with people and how it resonated. And also it even gave me some key words. Like in Indiana, we talk a lot about fairness and freedom. Well, they found that Indiana strength was a really strong, that resonated really well with Indiana voters. So I really recommend that you get a chance to kind of read through it. It's just really great work, but they sampled across. And then basically if people voted, you know, above a 50 was positive, below a 50 was negative. And we're going to talk about about some of the, the questions that they asked, but it was tied to understanding that if we're going to talk about an issue, we might as well talk about it all at once. You know, a lot of people talk about economics and racial issues, and we keep them separate. But what she found in her study was, in addition to framing your message properly, was it is really good at that point to just go all in. Talk about race and economy economic equity at the same time. Don't like section them off. And it was really interesting. So I, I didn't want to leave this part of it because it is called the race class narrative. And it's definitely worth a look-see and kind of understanding it. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's really, the concept is really interesting. Um, it really said, you know, you had more success with those middle people, those biconceptuals, when you just went all in, included the race narrative. And I'll show you how they phrased that too. Uh, you know, so it, it increased that positive response from those people. Now there's people that are our opposition, that are way conservative. Those are not the people we're looking to message to. We wanna make sure we have strong messages that resonate with our progressive values, but there's also an opportunity to pull those biconceptuals over. So we wanna make sure that uh, we consider that in, in kind of our messaging. Uh, so this is once again, a little wrap up about talking about race um, when you're doing your messaging. So if you want to talk about say broadband access, it's okay to talk about broadband access to immigrants, to inner city, to people of color, to that kind of thing all at once. Don't like shy away from it, they're basically saying. Um, and understand that, you know, when we talk about the shared value, like I believe all kids, including immigrants should have access to broadband so they can do their schoolwork. You know, we can also frame that problem is, and people are using racism and fear of immigration to divide us. And then there's that connect. It's really important together, we can make sure that 
racially everyone is you know treated fairly and that everyone has an opportunity to do well in school and have economic prosperity you know so uh, using that race uh, in, you know including that and not just kind of shying away from it's really good so here's an example of one of the one of the questions that they put out there as you can see We've got our blue base, which is a 74, you know, 50, and then to 74, it's a real positive. Opposition, when given this statement, even scored over a 50. Our persuadables, those are our, our kind of our biconceptuals, were at 70. So this is a really good result. And this is how they framed it. They were America's strength comes from our ability to work together, to knit together a landscape of people from different places and different races into one nation. So there's that you know, belief that we can work together on this. Um, th for this to be a place for freedom of all, we cannot let the greedy few and politicians they pay for divide us. So here we're talking about the problem, right? And then it's time to stand up for each other and come together. We can pick leaders who reflect the very best of every kind of American. Freedom is for everyone, no exceptions. So this got a very positive rating across the board, uh, even with the opposition, because how can they argue that freedom, what, it's not for everyone? And um, they can agree that there's a problem with the greedy few, the wealthy few, um, that kind of thing. So this, this type of messaging uh, went really well. And here's another example about working uh, people. As you can see, uh, the opposition didn't quite love it as much, but we have a strong, our base is strong there and our persuadables are really strong too. So no matter where we're from or what our color, most of us work hard for our families. And I read this and I just laughed because I wrote probably 400 postcards with that line on it. No matter what your color or where you're from, we all want the best for our families. That was the key term that Postcards for Voters did, well, like five and a half million postcards or more. Mm -hmm. um, so I laughed when I kind of saw that because you'll see consistency in the message and then you'll start to see the patterns that exist. So no matter where we come from, here we are, we're, we're bringing in that racial immigration, that kind of thing. Um, but certain politicians and greedy lobbyists hurt everyone by kickbacks, right? And defunding our schools, we've got Medicare in there. Uh, you know, so, you know, and then they, they turn it around and they try to make it their fault that, that they're having a hard time that, you know, immigrants, but we need to join together. So that's the solution. Um, you know, also reminding people of when we've joined together and it's been successful. I'm sure when, when the marches were going on in Selma and the boy, the, the Birmingham, Alabama bus boycott, people thought they were crazy and radical and had the worst ideas. Looking back though, most people would look at it and be like, that was a good thing. Uh, we improved America by that. So we remind people civil rights in our past by joining together, we can elect new leaders. And we really have great a great opportunity now because we actually have the tangibles to show people that a democratic led you know, Senate, House, and White House is a good thing for America. So our messaging is really, really on point there. Uh, so once again, Words to Win um, is a, a great website to go to, and Kaz has kind of put them in there. So we're going to dissect this narrative and like why it's so successful a little more. So no matter where we come from, what our color, most of us work hard for our families. And that discusses race overtly, and it includes everyone. Um, but today, certain politicians and their greedy lobbyists hurt everyone by handing, handing kickbacks um, and, and that kind of thing. So what we're doing is we are naming it. And there's a term called dog whistling. So when we hear Republicans use these terms like radical or uh, corrupt or things like that, uh, or they're using you know immigrants or them, they're trying to create this them culture. Those are the dog whistles, and it's okay to call out the dog whistles. So say you have a local candidate who's like, I, you know, no matter where we come from, what our color, most of us work hard for our families, and our families deserve a living wage, right? And you might be able to say, but our candidate has done everything in the, our incumbent or my competitor has done everything in their power to take these rights away from people and to prevent yada, 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 yada kind of thing, right? So they are, they're the harm, they're the problem. So we've created the problem. And then we can talk about, well, this is how it's gonna be better. If we join together, we can fight for our future. So it's that collective action. Um, we've, in the past, we've won better wages, safer workplaces, that kind of thing. So it's that cross solidarity, you know, we can win. 
um, people want to be on the winning team. You know, we have got a track record of, of doing good things kind of thing. Um, and then it talks about, you know, joining together, we can elect new leaders who work for all of us, not a wealthy few. So funny, because this is exactly what we were writing on postcards to millions of voters. So there is a consistency of the message. Uh, once you kind of figure out what your message is, uh, you can kind of stick to that kind of like a uh, template. Also, what's really important, so we're talking about like making sure that you're kind of got that that sandwich going on with your shared values, stating the problem, stating the solution, uh, that kind of thing. But there's some other things you want to make sure you're consistent with when you're talking about your message. Um, that we keep the message very simple, right? We don't want to make it beyond basic words. You know, I had a great coworker um, last year with Joe and she's like, keep it down to one, you know, easy, real talk, really simple kind of thing. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And you want to be authentic. We do not need to change what our core values are to trick people into voting for our issue or our candidate. We just need to be authentic. We just need to find those things that we connect on and exploit them because we need to be who we are. And you're gonna see the new leadership is very, very authentic. Also, we wanna paint images, like when we talk about storytelling, when we talk simple, you wanna create simple, concise images for people to connect to. So when we talk simple, keep it simple. Uh, here's some of the ones I used from the last presentation. Yeah, you know, we've got fair fight, very simple. We've got, you know, Pete wrote a book on trust. We talk real talk, very simple, real talk. Uh, we did a great program for, for Joe, uh, Indiana for Biden, which was called Biden's Fair Shot, because we knew that fair was very important uh, to um, Indian, Indianans or Hoosiers. Uh, for instance, we might want to use strength next time after looking at that study. Uh, this is a new one I pulled that I thought was really cool. It was called Ordinary Equality. Like it's just ordinary. Equality should just be ordinary, like it's routine. Um, and I thought that was a really good, simple way of kind of stating. So you want to make sure that you go back and, you know, either shave off a little bit and simplify the message. Just bring it down to simple words, easy to process. Uh, we're not talking over people. We're not talking about policy. Um, just really simple. And like I said, don't give up on your valleys values. It's authenticity. You know, I look at Pete and he just reeks authenticity. I look at someone like John and Reverend Warnock, often authentic people, Stacey Abrams, uh, you know, they're not, they haven't been in the pub politics eye for forever, but they really do come across as authentic at this point. Um, and it's really important that we're not looking to, you know, change our message to try to, like I said, trick people into thinking we agree with them. We want to stay with our message and bring them to us. Restore dignity, you know, super, super simple, uh, effective, you know, Joe, people really can't dispute that Joe's a pretty authentic, uh, empathetic kind of guy. He's an empathetic leader. Uh, so, you know, we will restore honor, build back better very simple uh, kind of thing, it really, really helps. And let's talk a little bit about imagery, painting those pictures, those stories. I thought it was really great when we started talking about infrastructure, you know, a few weeks ago, that we were really talking about buses and trains and bridges and people were talking simple terms that people could visualize, oh, that's a crumbling bridge. We're gonna fix that bridge. They kept it really, really simple, roads, bridges uh, kind of thing. And now that we are really heating up, they're expanding the imagery. So when they talk about it, um, they're using, you know, these great terms like we are going to be the, the world leader again. We are going to beat China. Uh, you know, we need to do these things. These are going to resonate with people. Um, you know, this is a once in a century investment. They refer a lot to Eisenhower's highway program, which I think is great. So it's creating these connections because, you know, Eisenhower, it's the past, but he was considered futuristic when he did it. Let's do the same thing. So it's really tying in really well across these frames from both nutrient, you know, progressive to conservative, where people can go, well, yeah, you know, we really do need to be number one. America's always, you know, you know, been the leader when it comes to innovation. We need to get that back. So I think they're doing a really, really great job for me. Um, I just love to deep dig deeper into that. 
I wanted to share with you this video of um, one uh, Secretary Granholm, and uh, they call her Jenny from the Mitten. <laughs> she is up mm -hmm. in Michigan, and she's an extremely relatable uh, kind of person. So I'm going to go to her video. It's you know it's just like a minute, and she is um, just fantastic in how she kind of ties it to everyone, where everyone can kind of understand it. So I want to play it for you. Since World War II, my name is Jennifer Granholm. I am head. There we go. The American Jobs Plan is the biggest investment in America <laughs> since World War II. My name is Jennifer Granholm. I am head of the Federal Department of Energy, and I want to address some of the myths that are out there about the American Jobs Plan. Infrastructure is only roads, bridges, and highways. No way. It's roads. It's bridges. It's highways. But it's also airports, seaports, trains, and broadband, of course. Infrastructure is so broad and it creates all kinds of jobs in all pockets of America. We can do both. There is a $23 trillion global market for the products that are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions out there. Who's going to be making those products? Where are they going to go? Well, we could do nothing or we could say we as a country are going to corner the market on a number of these products to put our people to work. That is such a myth. The clean energy solutions, like energy efficiency in appliances, save consumers massive amounts of money. The average family saves about $320 a year just by installing energy efficient appliances. That, to me, is the best kind of savings. If you want to learn more about this amazing American Jobs Plan, go to whitehouse.gov backslash American Jobs Plan. And I, I love how she really does tie it to something we've already done. Remember when everybody was buying those energy efficient um, appliances and that was, so people have done this already. She's kind of referring to like, they've done this already and been successful at it. So uh, she's getting a little flat. because I think it's a forward slash. So that was really funny. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> Uh -huh, yeah. It's really funny on Twitter what people kind of gravitate to, but I just loved how clear she was, uh, how nostalgic in a way, like she just seemed like a very relatable person to talk to. Uh, so they've done a really good job with the messaging and who they, the messenger. So I think that's really, really great. So we're going to wrap up the presentation, um, but I do want to tell you one thing uh, that I find really helpful. Uh, so say you're in a campaign and you want to kind of test out your message and, and see if it's kind of working. Uh, you can, you know, obviously go through and sample it and run a survey. Um, a basic SWOT analysis is always a great thing to do. So you're going to basically look at your message and say, what are the strengths and the weaknesses? What opportunities do we have with these messages? And what are the threats against them? Like what your what can your opponent kind of say against those messages? So the infamous SWOT analysis, which, you know, you can just Google it and pull up and uh, basically just create that, you know, Y, X axis and just kind of go, go to town on that. I feel is amazing whenever you're trying to brainstorm it. So uh, I think it's very applicable to messaging. Um, and one thing I love about messaging is you know it's working when the other side gets really upset because you've kind of taken away their power. You've usurped their message. Uh, as you can see, Republicans have been very angry lately. And I think the more that our messages are resonating and we're really good at like just getting the work done and talking about it, they're getting, they're not really happy right now. So if your opponent is not pleased, that's a really good sign. So in summary, remember, use your language. We don't want to be talking about our opponent at all. We don't want to feed the beast. We didn't feed Trump. When, when, when Biden was talking about Biden and build back better in the soul of America, three times better. You don't want to feed the beast. Know your beliefs. What's, what, you know, what, are you, what, is you, what are your morals? What's important to you? And repeat it over and over, consistent messaging. Um, and never repeat ideas that you don't believe in. So don't compromise yourself in order to just argue about something. Be positive. Everybody wants to, you know, they want to get on the positive boat. They don't want to be dealing with any more problems, uh, be authentic, you know, speak your truth, say it simply, 
um, and tell your story, you know, have your candidate um, or your organization talk about their story of why they're there and what they're doing, and why it's important to them and use imagery, use really simple images uh, to attach that uh, for people. So let's hop off and we'll go over to our question and answer. And also if anyone has, um, you know, questions, let's see here. I'm going to give you a chance to unmute yourselves. You're good to go. Kaz, did we have any uh, questions? We had some, uh, some input. Yeah, well, we had one question that is something that we haven't covered. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll make it brief, but uh, uh, briefer than what they stated. But um, how do we deal with, so we were talking a lot about how we counter on um, uh, message to, to break through to you know, the big tent kind of uh, thinking. Um, well, how do we deal with um, uh, people who are messengers on the left who have resent this kind of change in messaging and they like the more, um, the more, you know, punchy, <laughs> but punchy terminology, you know, and I think you see that come up a lot um, when there's any kind of resistance to um, right now the, the defund the police. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll hear people say that's an ineffective uh, 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 slogan, and then other people are like, "It's you know, no, this is it's not even a slogan. This is exactly what we want." So, what would you say to somebody um, who takes that stance, who says yeah. that we shouldn't be making these, you know, we should, uh, these empathetic large <laughs> statements, but instead just really um, punching through um, with with uh, a strong, you know, yeah. Uh, some people it's 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 an all or nothing we had a lot of that with climate change and the green new deal that you weren't going far enough you're not do going far enough you got to push farther um and it's much like those people way out conservatives right we're going to have way out conservative leftists uh we know basically that uh the the harm and horror kind of uh you know attitude of you know the cops are all going to kill us kind of thing unless we get rid of every cop that is not how we build a democratic coalition. It doesn't work. We have to speak differently to Democrats. We're not the Republicans. So I have an attitude of I show them, don't tell them attitude is build it and then they'll believe it when they see it kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, we've had, you know, throughout the primary, we had a lot we had 24 candidates with very, they had to put some space between each other. We had a lot of the Bernie group that were like, you're not, you know, and they were really kind of, they were angry and and and, and very loud. But I really feel like um, if you look at like the coalition of what's building in the White House, AOC is not really coming out against Biden. You know, we're not hearing a lot of that because there there's consensus building, building going on. So I feel like a moderate, uh, positive consensus building is going to be more of results and we're going to be able to show them like, okay, we, we understand why you're so angry. We want to make sure we get something done and this is how we do it. And you just repeat that message over and over again. Yeah. Defund police is one of the worst things that happened in the 2020 election cycle, uh, in my opinion. So, and it's still not helpful. So I hope yeah. that helps. If anyone has anything to contribute where they think it would work, please speak up too. Yeah. I mean, I, so, and I mentioned in the chat that there are different, you know, there, there's messages for different purposes, right? So, so there is, there, there is a purpose to having a very disrupting message, um, you know, to garner attention and stuff and, and stuff like that. It does serve a purpose. So it's not like, oh, it's, it's altogether bad, but right. yeah, when you're trying to um, persuade <laughs> that's not the time to use a defiant message. So, so yeah, has and I, as a, as studying conflict resolution, mm -hmm. I think a big blow up conflict is really healthy because when it settles, when we actually get to the nitty gritty of the, the, the conversation, um, I think we get a lot better results that way. So, and I think it's righteous anger. I think uh, uh, it's righteous to feel this way about what's going on. So I don't mm -hmm. like say, oh, you're dumb for thinking to fund the police. No, it's this is righteous rage that you know people of color have that people that support Black Lives Matter have. Uh, so it's understanding that and just you know showing them that this is we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. Great. Do we have any another one? I see lots of comments in the chats. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, Judith, you have um, you have a question here. Plus, I'd like you to share if you would be willing to um, share your story about um, that you shared earlier 
about um, the, the, the person who polled um, those people about what their values were. So if you would like to unmute, you should be able to unmute. You wanna first ask your question and then it'd be great if you could share that story. Well, the related, a related question to the one that was already asked is how do we approach um, people who call themselves progressives, um, who insist that other Democrats are the problem, that we're too timid and we don't take a strong enough stand and, and even call people corrupt the way Elizabeth Warren did of Pete during the primary with the whole wine caves thing. Yeah, so, I feel, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's, 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 you're always in any coalition, you're going to have people that are going to be naysayers. It, it's never going to be enough. Um, so, you know, personally for me, I just respect them, but there is that shared value. And if you identify with them, so what are you telling me? You want big money out of politics? What are you saying when you say wine caves and, and things like that? It's not about the candidate. It's about, what's, what's that shared value that you have with that person? which is politics sucks. I think you're right. We need to fix that. So I would go outside of like making it personal and go down to that, find that mutual respect that you agree. It, your your agree, degree of ag agreement may vary, right? You may be 50 and they may be 150, but you do agree still on that shared value. Just like with somebody that might be a conservative in your family mm -hmm. uh, agrees on you know, radical freedom from no government, you might agree that there mm -hmm. are things that the government can do that are helpful. So yeah, I, I would just definitely use the same tactic and, and tie to the, that shared value you have with that person. That's great advice. Well, the, the story that I told was um, uh, years ago, we were <clears throat> in, um, uh, I was part of a lawsuit against um, a local human services agency, an office of in intellectual disability services. And everybody agreed that the system sucked and needed to be much better. And so we brought in a facilitator who gathered a group of stakeholders in the system and did this values clarification exercise. And he asked everybody to write down the five most important <clears throat> things in their lives. And then, you know, he put them all together and, and um, identified um, six Im important values that, that emerged from this as really shared values. And they were family, friendships, loving relationships, a good job, um, good health, and spirituality. And, and the, we decided we're going to redesign the service system so that it fulfills those values, which happened to be, if you were to identify six things that people with, people who are served by that system don't have, you know, they're cut off from their families, they're not allowed to have loving relationships, they have few friends, their healthcare um, is, you know, less than ideal, they don't have jobs, they're not, they don't have opportunities to practice their faith. And, and so the goal was to redesign the system so that- Yeah, and you, you, you went with something that everybody's gonna have consensus on, shared values. Yeah. It wasn't specifics yeah. about, I believe I should get so-and-so this amount or whatever resources. It was, you can't dispute it. So you have that consensus building across those values. And then yeah. you can build up the messaging or what you need to, to share with the people that are going to decide who gets those resources, um, you yeah. know, because we're, we're really talking about uh, changing, you know, uh, being able to speak to people who have the power, which whether it's it's an elected official or it's a voter who has the power of their vote um, or someone in that kind of position, uh, speaking, and you're able to communicate those shared values and they can't debate it. They can't say, well, that's a silly thing to ask for spirituality and an opportunity. You know, you just can't debate it when it's real, when it's a real moral value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
And Peggy brings up a, a good point. This is something that I, I, I see a lot too. On social media, people who repeat falsehoods in order to refute them. <laughs> so, oh, I, Kim, can you give me an example? That sounds interesting. <laughs> Well, I, I, I gave one in the chat where, you know, there's that one, a, a one liner that they're, that, that's going around where it says journalism is not the enemy. <laughs> well, you just introduced the idea of germ, journalism as the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like, where we don't want to be saying, we don't want to be feeding the beast, you know. Well, but I see people, you know, just repeating Republican memes or all kinds of things and then getting extremely upset when anybody even tries to gently tell them yeah good idea not to repeat the falsehood here's how yeah. it so we address a lot of that in our disinformation because that what we're talking about there is disinformation and a lot of times people will use the talking point as their evidence of the talking point so you know journalism is corrupt. Well, journalism is corrupt when you ask them for more on that. Like, well, what do you mean by journalism is corrupt? Uh, so Kaz will talk about that on Thursday, about that whole like level of disarming disinformation and not uh, feeding the beast of it kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it talks to how you don't want to be in a position of defending yourself or repeating your opponent's um, position on something uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, you know, mm -hmm. Joe Biden will not take your guns away. Well, we're talking about taking guns away. They don't. I guess you know. I'm asking for strategies to yeah. educate people. Other you have, right. So that, you get really resentful when you try to say anything. Yeah. So that's where you talk about what the value is attached to not having your guns taken away. Yeah. So we believe people have a right to protect their families, or we believe people have a right to have you know, our guns, but just have background checks. So the solution is really simple. So you want to go below it, almost like under the current of all that noise and crazy static and disinformation and say, well, what are you really trying to get to? Are you trying to say you want to protect your family? Uh, it's not about anybody taking your guns away. I mean, we do have that argument, but then you're in that debate again and you don't want to be reinforcing that negative message. Uh, so you want to really go down to like, yeah, I think it's really important that we get to protect our families. And I think our society would be safer if the wrong people didn't have guns, you know, things like that. So you're getting to those core values versus kind of debating it on the same level up mm -hmm. here, or, or should we say down there, we want to bring it up here when we talk about morals and values. Yeah, that yeah help, a lot of it's just um, you know we uh, we have we have we have bad habits, right? I yeah. think a lot of a lot of dens have bad habits, and I mean we it's what we were built around, right? So for 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 all these decades, the the um, democratic messaging was just a reaction to what the GOP was putting out. So whatever the GOP would say, we would say no, not that, right? So that's also the the habit isn't just our, us um, ourselves. It's something that that yeah that, that that progressives. It's just it's just all that you kind of know yeah. about messaging. So Plus how we push, change it? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's we have to change it because and we have to we have to retrain ourselves to not to fall to not fall into those traps. So that's yeah. where mm -hmm. looking at your messaging or you know how do I counter mm -hmm. uh, something is really getting ahead of it before you're kind of defending yourself from it. So it just takes- Speaking of countering, mm -hmm. John would like to know, um, how do you best counter the socialism arguments? <laughs> someone who calls, says that, you know, that's, that, that, that's socialism. Whenever I asked them, um, what does socialism mean to you? So tell me what socialism is. And then you can start dissecting it and drilling down to what the values are. So you're afraid this will happen. You don't want that to happen. Uh, you want, you don't want, you know, the government running our companies or whatever, because a lot of people don't really know what socialism is or, and personally, I, if you asked me to write down a definition of socialism, Marxism, communism, I probably would get it wrong. Like I'm not super interested in that because I know it's not happening. Um, but I always ask them, what, what does that mean to you? If, if, if we, you know, when you called Biden a socialist. What does that mean to you? And then you can break it. You, it becomes broken into parts and you can kind of manage it a little better and say, oh, so you don't want government run health care. OK, well, do you have another idea like how we can make sure people have access to medical health care without going bankrupt? Mm -hmm. You know, so we're not confronting them on the statement they're making, we're asking them to tell us more. And Kaz talks a lot about that when you're sharing your story or experience, 
like your candidate or, or your organization can share their experience, um, it becomes personal and you can drill down and it opens up for the other person to share with you. Like if a family member says, well, you know, I don't want to be, a, you know, you're all Marxist radicals or whatever. What do you mean by a Marxist radical? Because I don't understand it, you know, kind of thing. So I just drill it down. Yeah, and Tom has a has a great um, uh, message in chat, talking about how yeah the um, often when you see socialism being used, you're using it as um, as a pole, right? As capitalism on one pole and socialism on the other. Um, so so introducing the idea, you know, if you have a chance to 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 talk first, hear what they see. Um, you know, how do they define socialism? What do they mean by that? And then if you can offer that it's not this polarized thing that, yeah, there is this gradation um, between socialism and, 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 and capitalism. So, yeah. so just offering that, you know, kind of busting that um, or kind of redefining that, that word, um, you know, and then sh so when you're sharing, okay, well, this is what it means to me, right? You're not then taking this hardline polarized stance, right? Because you're saying, no, there are no poles. It is a, it's in the spectrum. So, so yeah, that, that might be able to help, you know, again, after you find out what they're thinking. Because when I would train for phone divided. banking, for instance, when we would be calling people for the runoff, I said, you're not going to get into a policy discussion with somebody. You're not going to start debating socialism because you would get someone that answered the phone and go, yeah, I'm calling on behalf of John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock. Oh, you bunch of commie, blah, blah, blah. And you don't want to, have you're not going to have that discussion with them because you, it's not going to go anywhere but if you get someone who's like well i i you know i think he's going to do this or do that you can drill down the specifics of like what does that mean like john talks about getting covid relief and getting our kids back to school and get real specific what does that mean to you if you know kind of thing um versus you know what is socialism? What do you like? Because you, you you don't want to say what are you afraid of, but if you find out what they're afraid of, you can counter that with like, well, yeah, I want to make sure that uh, you know I can. We have a free market. That's really important to me too. You know, my husband's starting a new business and or or things like that. So you it helps you drill it down to dissect it to get to those real core kind of uh, you know those shared values. Uh, you know, someone throws something at you about immigrants and they're all rapists or something horrible. Well, have you ever met immigrants? Like, uh, you know, I think people are people and not everybody is is bad to start off with. And they're, you know, that kind of thing. You can you can try to find a connection on that shared value. And let's see. Um, I see Tom. Does anyone have like a specific messaging that they're working on? I know we're going over, it's 9-11, so thank you for bearing with us. You're welcome to pop off, or if you're still enjoying the discussion, please stay with us. I love talking with you. But does any anybody have anything they're working on specifically now, like with a group or a campaign or a family member or a work issue that they're trying to talk about progressive messaging on that we can kind of work with? Yeah, so we can kind of say that, you know, our, when we talk about like the infrastructure that's out there right now, when we talk about the, uh, you know, the H1N1, the uh, People's uh, Voting Act kind of thing, um, you know, like we talked about earlier, there is those difference between like, we see it as the People's Voting Rights Act, they see it as, you know, Corrupt Politicians Act. So, um, you know, when we're talking about framing and talking to people, um, connect with those morals and those values first, do your best to drill down why do you think that? Tell me more about that. That's a great phrase that Kaz uses in when she's having a, she has a session on talking to people about politics who don't want to talk about politics, right? Um, you know, tell me more. What do you mean by that? Because people are not used to that. They're used to someone saying, oh, you're just an a-hole who doesn't like progressive policies, or you think I, it's no, no, you're going to throw them off guard if you say, hey, well, what do you mean? I, tell me more about that. Um, it's a great tactic if you really want to upset someone too. Like someone really is not going to be nice if you say, well, "What do you mean?" I, I, if you make them further explain, uh, it really gets their goats. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Judith is agreeing that you know when we talk infrastructure, uh, you know, we even th we even have healthcare workers in there and all kinds of things. Um, you know, I think progressives tend to put the sky's the limit. We put the dream. 
agenda out there. Uh, we'll see where we end up settling kind of thing, but we really want the best for everybody. Our policies are, you know, empathetic and compassionate and cooperation. There's just, there's no uh, unkindness involved in them, you know, so. And I, I like Norm's comment that um, say what you mean. So rather than saying H1N1, call it yep. swine flu, right? Or yep. rather than saying HR1, right? Don't say HR1, say, call it the Voting Rights Act. So so, yep. so directly say what you mean. I, I have a thing, so I work in science and I have a thing of, of just, you know, never using jargon. Like when you're in a broad audience, get rid of all of the jargon, right? Because you want to actually be talk, telling people exactly what you're talking about. And a lot of this stuff hides behind that jargon. Well, that jargon immediately, um, Creates you know, barrier. provides, yeah, create, creates an in-group and an out-group. And you want to get rid of that, right? So, so just say what you mean. Sometimes you got to say more words. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) it is so true. I do it. I was just talking this whole time. And I really, um, you know, say what you're for. Democrats need to say what we're for. We're for families. We're for, you know, Pete had a slogan, freedom, democracy, security. And uh, that really appealed to me because it was reclaiming what was considered (laughs) a conservative value. We all want freedom, security, democracy. I want freedom from people telling me what to do with my body, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it can apply to both sides when it comes to progressive messaging. We need to reclaim those statements uh, when we talk about family and, uh, you know, caring for uh, the elderly and things like that. We want to provide for them. Yeah. And- Tom's got a previous question. Do mm-hmm. Dems have to go a go-to site? I know. There are some progressive think tanks, but I'm very, very jealous of what the Heritage Foundation has done uh, because it's all covered right there. Uh, The DNC has the DNC War Room, uh, which provides a lot of, uh, uh, you know, kind of like tidbits, uh, uh, but you have to dig for them. So it's a little frustrating. Um, I have to admit the GOP does make it a lot easier to to grab onto that messaging. Uh, So I, the best bets to follow like the White House, follow the DNC, uh, follow the DNC war room on Twitter, mm-hmm. um, you know, get attached to some really good uh, accounts that you like, whether it's on yeah. social media or, you know, Facebook, Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some really good people out there that already have the messaging. Research, um, we did put the links. I think Kaz probably put them in there already. Um, check out Anat's uh, work. It's fantastic. She did a really awesome talk with the the Sister District Summit, where it's her keynote, and she shows you commercials that she put together to address certain progressive issues, but they were real, the messaging was just really on target, super simple and relatable, shared values, that kind of thing. So uh, I love to look at things like on YouTube that people are talking about, but yeah, as far as finding a progressive think tank that does that messaging, um, I haven't popped, one has not popped to mind for me. So, but if we find some, there's a lot of them out there, but if we find something, we'll, we'll be sure to share it um, through our uh, website. Yeah, Kaz, yeah. Biden's cabinets, I'm really happy. And that was one thing that, um, that happened with Obama was Obama was a policy guy. He would throw the facts and it would bounce off those frames and people would be like, well, I don't understand what, what, what he's talking about. Also, the incredible work they did in 2009 with the Recovery Act to help, you know, with, with getting all the banks out and all the all kind of thing, the automotive industry. That was an amazing work they did. They didn't talk about it. They didn't market it. They didn't message it. If you look at what Joe's doing, he's constantly having people go out there and saying, look what we've done. Oh, we got 100 million, 200 million shots in arms. Uh, we've, we're opening schools. We're putting checks. Their message is very clear and succinct. So when it comes to getting those votes in 20, you know, this year, and to, to, especially 2022, 20, um, we're going to have the receipts to show them. And they're, it's already going to be planted in their, their, we're changing that framing of like, Democrats do nothing for me, do nothing Democrats, or, or all those little slogans we would hear. That's, we just need to reinforce that, well, look what we, money in your pocket, your kids are going to school, and there's a shot in your arm, and very specific. So we're, we're kind of catching on to that. Great. Yeah, so this presentation will be posted on our website. Uh, just, you know, If you check out our calendar, all the hyperlinks are in there to sign up through our Mobilize account. Uh, We've got 
fun stuff going on over the weekend. Uh, the book club is starting up. I highly recommend. And then, of course, every Thursday, uh, Kaz and I are hosting uh, the Real Talk. So disinformation next week. After mm -hmm. that, we're going to have uh, grassroots organizing for change. So it teaches you how to like kind of form your grassroots group and run a, a local group or whatever, you know, one person, two people, you could do it by yourself kind of thing. Uh, and then we go back to um, unlock your political power, talking about your story and being able to communicate to people uh, and get them to open up to you. And then, of course, we'll, we'll continue with our uh, Say This, Not That series. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. It's great to hear. Yeah. And uh, by the way, George Lakoff, check him out. Any of his books I recommend, they're a quick read, they're real short, uh, they're just really, really cool kind of a light bulb kind of going on there. So yeah, and please reach out if you have any questions or needs. And if you're interested in helping out, especially social media, let us know in the chat. Uh, you'd be working with Wes, he's wonderful. He's got a great team. We're just looking for someone uh, primarily for Facebook uh, to just do a few posts on Facebook for us. So great, thanks team. Feel free to stay on if you'd like uh, and ask uh, Kaz and I any questions. Hey, Joyce. Good to see you, Joyce, or your picture. Ava, I wanted to say I really love your t-shirt. <laughs> hey, unmute yourself, Joyce. Thank you, Peggy. And I was muted too. I'm talking and you can't hear me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Technology, it's a pain in the butt sometimes. <laughs> it's Great good job, and Benny. It's bad. Yeah. Great well, job. And George thank Lakoff, you. I have been trying to get something going with George Lakoff for, since 2016. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see you're pushing it and making it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that, forefront. if you want to know, uh, there's a four part series that Kaz put the link in for um, where they do. It's all recorded on YouTube, so you could just watch it. But the gentleman, he breaks down the whole framing and then he talks about applying the framing and it, he, it's really good. Uh, Is that a current Kaz's one or because back in 2016, uh, I was seeing lectures he was in i was it was it's yeah. like everywhere i he turned has, i, was I think he's ill i think george is not actively out there right now that's what i was afraid of so yeah. anat is awesome if you like george you're really gonna like her uh so okay. i would check her out too she's currently doing stuff um but um yeah the, the recordings that this group did they did in um uh 2020 and they are currently running programs on monday nights where they talk about framing specifically uh, oh, wow. Okay. Off of Lakoff's work. Um, I kind of been touching on him and then also other work that's out there that is kind of based on that foundation that's building on it. Kind of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. That, I mean, he's the foundation. There's so much more, but I yeah. just keep telling people, I've been telling him, you've got to just read this book. Yeah. It's just, it's like, to me, it starts the fire yeah. to want to know what's, how do we say things that are different? Because, like yeah. it was been said, the Republicans, are brilliant at it i hate to say that but yeah. they are brilliant at marketing mm -hmm. things and the picture that you showed really because really got to me because i always say democrats talk to your brain republicans hit you in the gut yeah so what they, do you remember that hit in the gut and that's what impacts you when you go to do anything yep. the brain eh, you're done listening and the, that hit in the gut. It's, it's a story an emotional response you're going yeah. to remember something with an emotional story behind it not someone telling you how great their policy is about uh, infrastructure or yeah. and that's what we used to do. We just uh, really tend to- Well, we, we intellectualize things because there's a group of us that want to hear all the details and yeah. it's, but it's not yeah. to the masses. Yeah. It's, yeah. And that's where we're wrong. And um, there's a great book that I was reading and it talks further about kind of like communicating with different groups and how we just really- have a tendency to talk down and it's created a resentment. I mean, people felt like Hillary was talking down to them all the time yeah. because she's so smart and she and, spoke and that, like And Democrat. that's the problem. I don't think they're talking down, but they're just- How we talk. I think they gave America's more credit. America, you know, as, as a population, I think they gave that they're more, that they're more capable of stuff. Yeah. So and, that's, and, and, then, and then they don't want to tell you they don't understand because then they're embarrassed. Right. Uh, so that's why keeping it a very simple message is really, really important. Yeah. I fell into the trap in this presentation, speaking in, you know, acronyms and terms and things like that. And I, t I actually want to do a talk about making sure that you're not excluding people by the, what the words you use. Yeah. Like you just start so off the wrong way. Yeah. But I'm really impressed with Biden. I don't know who's his marketing team, yeah. but I think they've got a whole new marketing concept 
that the Democrats yeah. have just never done. And I, I really hope that as marketing team who they are, their names become known because I think we need to make sure that they're utilized in yeah. lots of ways. Yeah. Because I, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Well, and it, 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 the results are there. Like I say, um, Democrats know what they're doing. We're really, really good at what we're yeah. doing. We just never really good at talking about it the right well, way. It's, it's almost like the, it's, it's more appropriate not to brag about ourselves. Right. And that's where we have to realize that bragging a bit is good. And yeah. that's exactly, you know, Republicans will brag about, oh, there was a great thing. Um, it was a comedian and she was talking to somebody. It was like one of those competition shows on cable and somebody was upset. It was a woman and she was upset about something to where she was. Why don't you just pretend you're a man? Because um, any man would have been happy with what you turned in. Like they just mm. have this ability to, ex and I don't say there's just men here, but it's just, it's ingrained in them that mediocrity is, is okay. She's like, act like Boris Johnson, that you're the best thing that ever happened without any substance. To yeah. it. And I was like, well, as sad as that is, that's how we raise men that it's yeah. enough for them. They don't go, oh, I don't know if I did a good job. There's a chip in it or a flaw kind of yeah. thing. And it's like, we have to stop second guessing like Democrats what we're doing because the republicans they don't have a leg to stand on and they and still are the loudest in the room i know and, and that's and it's so funny because it's with men too like i could when i've talked to anybody about if they're going to run for office or do something um, if you ask a man do you want to do this he's a yes or a no if he wants to or if you ask a woman she's like well i don't know let me see. i don't know if i have the criteria or not yeah. i don't know if i, I don't think i have not. the skills Tell me more about yeah. the job or not and it's just so funny that we yep. We don't have the audacity to go, and we have that imposter syndrome. So I'm yeah. going to be talking to some kids from a local university next week that are mm. kind of in this this you know global women's studies course, and it's about being a change agent. And oh, the biggest gosh. thing is, is you don't ask permission and wait for someone to say you're qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. have to do it. And, and a lot a of people huge... don't have the the nerve. Uh, they have and, to build it up. And that's a huge shift that I hope we have to get more women to do that. Mm -hmm. So we can have more women taking roles because they're, they're as competent, if not more competent mm -hmm. with their lack of abilities, you know, their lack. And of it's, it's nobody's structure. fault. It's just culturally how yeah. we mm -hmm. accept things and we train people to, you know, and it, it creates a caste system that mm -hmm. works for people. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have to break down those barriers for sure. The part of this is mm -hmm. part of the change. Whoever mm -hmm. has got their thing, be the change you wish to see the world. Yes. Yes. You know? There you go. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's a great concept that I hope I think, and you're doing it. So I really appreciate the work yeah, you're doing. You too, Joyce. You too. Joyce yeah. was uh, is is head of Indiana Nasty Women. Is it still called?